Good morning. My name is Alan Papier. I'm a fixed income product specialist at Nuveen and a proud volunteer of CFA Society Chicago. Today our prominent guest speaker is Jim Bullard, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. In this role, he's a participant on the Federal Reserve's Federal Open Market Committee, which has eight regularly scheduled meetings per year to set the direction of U.S. monetary policy. St. Louis will be a voting member of the FMOC in 2019. President Bullard is co-editor of the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control, a member of the Central Bank Research Association's Senior Council, and an honorary professor of economics at Washington University, where he also sits on the Advisory Council of the Economics Department and the Advisory Board of the Center for Dynamic Economics. As an economist, policymaker, and public figure, we applaud his commitment to transparency and candor. He also serves on the Board of Trustees of the United Way USA and the Board of Directors of the St. Louis Regional Chamber. He received his doctorate from Indiana University. Now, please help me welcome Jim Bullard. Well, thanks so much, and thanks for inviting me here today to uh, speak to this August group. I'm looking forward to a raucous conversation as, uh, as we go through this, uh, this talk and get to the Q&A here. What a beautiful venue. Uh, those of you that are listening uh, or watching on across the world are missing out on this beautiful room here and the view of the lake, and it's a beautiful day here in Chicago. It's a beautiful day for the U.S. economy as well, um, which is, uh, I think, uh, you know, growing at a rapid pace. Uh, all the businesses that I talk to are very uh, optimistic about their current situation. So a lot of what we're doing in monetary policy in a talk like this is not really talking about exactly where we are today, but where are we going to be uh, two years from now? And so that's what I want to focus on in this talk. Uh, think about what the best strategy is for extending the U.S. economy, uh, economy's expansion. This expansion has been going on for quite a while. There is talk of, that it will come to an end at some point, which I, I'm sure it will, but we would like that to be farther in the future and not closer in the future. So what can we do as monetary policymakers to uh, extend the length of this uh, already long expansion? <clears throat> so my preferred approach to this is to put more weight on market signals uh, than has been customary in past U.S. monetary policy strategy. Uh, and so I'll talk about that, but if you just wanted a one-sentence summary of what I'm saying, uh, we, would f we would always put some weight on financial market signals and then some weight on traditional macroeconomic signals. But now in the current environment, I think we should shift more of the weight toward the financial market signals. I'll give you reasons for that. And by market signals, I'm explicitly referring to information from the yield curve and from market-based measures of inflation expectations. So the key themes here are that the empirical Phillips curve relationships have largely broken down in the last two decades, leaving monetary policymakers without a clear guidepost for what to do. I'm going to talk, I have a whole section of the paper about, or in this uh, talk about this. Um, and because of that, I think it's time to take market signals more seriously than we would have in the past. And if we do this correctly, you know, it is sensitive exactly how you handle this, the signals because could, they could mean a lot of things, but uh, handled properly, the Open Market Committee could better identify the neutral policy rate and therefore po possibly extend uh, the U.S. Ex economic expansion. So that's the main. If, if you want to go back to eating your breakfast now, then uh, you just done here. So. Um, so let me talk first about this breakdown of the Phillips curve, which I think is more serious and uh, more complete than commonly appreciated. I think a lot of people give lip service to this. They say, yeah, yeah, it's not quite what it used to be. But then when they go ahead with their analysis about what policymakers should do, Phillips curve is all over the place and, you know, you should raise rates because unemployment's low. 
So this thing has broken down badly, and I want to tell a story about why that occurred. Around 1995, the U.S. inflation rate reached 2 percent, and inflation expectations stabilized near that value. So that was, in my mind, that's the end of the Volcker era. You finally stabilized inflation in the U.S. in the mid-1990s. And after 1995, we had an implicit inflation target of 2 percent, and basically we've achieved, you know, in the big picture, big sense, we've achieved the 2 percent low and stable inflation and low and stable inflation expectations ever since. So my main argument is that the world with stabilized inflation and inflation expectations is different than the previous world, the, the 70s world, where inflation expectations would bounce all over the place and the Fed had to get ahead of that. <clears throat> so the 1990s were a period when the whole world was moving toward inflation targeting led by uh, New Zealand, UK, other, other economies. And the 2% inflation target became an international standard. And by the way, if anyone's talking to you about changing the inflation target, you should, you should mention this. It has become an international standard. And because of that, the U.S. cannot be upsetting that international standard. You'd get into a lot of trouble globally, I think, if you started to say, well, every country can now move their inflation targets around. That would, that would cause a breakdown internationally of discipline on inflation. So um, the 2 percent target became an international standard, and inflation expectations stabilized around that value. But when that happened, <coughs> The old empirical relationships between unemployment and inflation broke down, and uh, so the Phillips curve disappeared. The empirical Phillips curve disappeared. It went away, and that's why we can't rely on it as a signal today about what, what, what's going to happen to inflation. So uh, I'm going to show you some empirical. This is the geeky part. Uh, so get your geek hats on. So the, uh, there's empirical evidence on the Phillips curve. This is not by us at the St. Louis Fed. This is by the uh, Bank for International Settlements in Basel. Uh, they put this out in their annual report last year. Uh, the data are for a panel of G7 economies. Um, the co this is a coefficient in a regression uh, of inflation on resource utilization like unemployment. But what's neat about this picture is we're using 15-year rolling samples. So in the 80s, you're going to be using data from the 70s and 80s. But in the, today, you'd only be using the last 15 years of data. So it's a rolling 15-year uh, sample. And we're going to look at just this coefficient, this point estimate uh, of the relationship between inflation and resource utilization. And it's, uh, <clears throat> it's a point average uh, across all G7 economies. And uh, so here's the picture. So this starts in the, in the 80s and comes up to the present. Um, the horizontal line there is zero. That would mean the coefficient is zero, which means there's no relationship at all. Um, but if you look back in the 80s, and those shaded regions are the confidence bounds around these estimates. <clears throat> so in the 80s, you would have had, and you did this kind of exercise, you would have a significant negative relationship, meaning Unemployment's low, inflation's high. And uh, that started to disappear. You went into the 90s, and you moved to the right on the chart, and you moved farther to the right on the chart. This thing has broken down completely. Zero coefficient. Zero coefficient. So the idea that we're just going to, oh, I, I see unemployment's low, therefore we've got to raise rates and keep inflation under control. What are you talking about? This thing has broken down. So the conventional wisdom in current monetary policy is all based on Phillips curves and suggests that policy rates should continue to rise in order to contain any increase in inflationary pressures. But today, in the inflation targeting era, neither low unemployment nor faster real GDP growth, which isn't in the picture, gives a reliable signal of inflationary pressure because those empirical relationships have broken down. So if you continue to raise the policy rate just because you see good things happening in labor markets in this environment, there's a big risk that you would go too far and, you know, uh, then you'll 
push the economy into recession sooner than it would otherwise go into recession. So what can be done? I'm suggesting that we put more weight on financial market signals than we have in the past, and let's start with the yield curve. Um, generally speaking, um, I would say the yield curve suggests that current monetary policy is neutral or even somewhat restrictive today, even with the level of the policy rate where it is today, which is low by historical standards, but it is high for the current environment. Um, the yield curve is quite flat uh, partly because of uh, contained inflationary pressure and the, uh, I, I would say that financial markets are saying that the, um, the SEP, which is the way the committee uh, says what it's going to do in the future, the financial market, you guys, I guess, uh, think that, uh, that, that we should be more dovish than what the SEP says. So here's a picture that you'd be very familiar with. Here's the 10-year, one-year spread uh, over the last few years. It was uh, relatively high in 2014. It's been declining ever since. Looks like we're on the way to inversion in the not too distant future, unless something changes. Uh, cer certainly looks like this is gonna uh, continue and invert eventually. Who cares if the yield curve inverts? Well, it's a pretty good predictor of future uh, real economic activity in the U.S. That's, you can go to the academic research and look at that, but I'm just gonna do one chart, which is this chart. Uh, here's the 10-year, one-year spread. You could use other spreads here. Uh, here are the three most recent recessions, and the inversions are circled there at the bottom uh, right before all three. Uh, inversions. Now, if this actually happens uh, in 2018, 2019, you have to get an inversion. It has to last for a while, and even then, recession would be a little ways in the future, probably a year on average, according to this. So it's not, it's not just that uh, all of a sudden the economy turns on a dime, but it, it is a pessimistic, bearish signal for, uh, for the economy. The Fed has poo-pooed uh, yield curve inversion um, in speeches and, and talks before the previous two recessions, uh, always giving arguments about why this time is different, always giving arguments about why the analysis at the Fed was right and the markets were wrong, but the markets were right both of these times and also in all the other uh, uh, previous, the ones that aren't on this chart uh, earlier in the post-war era. I wanted to keep the chart to this because this is the inflation targeting era. Uh, I would say pre-95 is a different game when inflation expectations were unanchored. You could look at alternative term spreads and there's a working paper out at the Fed that does this. Um, my view on this is that basically these, these term spreads are highly correlated. Looking at one versus looking for the other is kind of kind of splitting hairs a little bit. Um, if, they, if we do get inversion, basically all, all of them will invert. And uh, uh, there's a good story about why this works, uh, even though it doesn't work in a, it, very well in an academic type model. But the story would be that the Fed is controlling short end of the yield curve, markets more oriented to controlling the long end. And when there's a difference in views is when, uh, when you get the yield curve inversion. Okay, another market-based signal that I like to look at is the, uh, is the market-based inflation expectations derived from uh, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, TIPS. And that is based on headline consumer price index inflation, but the Fed likes to talk about uh, personal consumption expenditures inflation. Uh, historically, CPI has run about 30 basis points higher than the PCE inflation, uh, so I've, I'll make that 30 basis point adjustment here. Uh, I also realize that other factors can influence TIPS-based measures of inflation expectations, but I'm going to ignore that here. You could have a risk premia in there, you could have other things. Uh, that would just make my case stronger, I think, to put that kind of stuff in here. So I'm going to ignore that here. 
So here are the tips-based measures of in, just reading them straight up as inflation expectations over the last several years. Uh, the blue line is the five-year, five-year forward. Uh, the other lines are the two-year and the five-year. These are all adjusted by 30 basis points to convert from CPI to PCE. So I would read the, the right-hand part of this chart as saying that right now, markets don't think the Fed is going to hit the inflation tar target on a PCE basis over the next two years, over the next five years, or over the next five years after that. So if you just read this straight up the way I'm reading it, it's, I don't see a lot of confidence that in the Fed that we're going to hit our inflation target, or even over those kind of long periods of time where you would think that uh, markets would have confidence in, that the Fed is going to do it. And if you look backwards here, um, the, the, uh, these market expectations of inflation have predicted subdued inflation for several years, and that's what has actually happened. So the yield curve information suggests that financial markets do not see excessive real growth or excessive inflationary pressure on the forecast horizon. That's why the long rate is as low as it is. Uh, the tips-based inflation compensation data suggests that markets do not think the Fed will hit its inflation target on a PCE basis over the next decade. Now, you might say, uh, gee, Jim, markets can be wrong. You guys wouldn't say that, but some would say that. So uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of uh, financial market information? Um, I think, first of all, markets are naturally forward-looking. They're trying to take account of all possible future developments and make a judgment as best they can about uh, what's going to happen. So I think it naturally constitutes a forward-looking policy to the extent you're looking at a forward-looking signal. Um, and it's a great strength of financial market information that you're incorporating all developments in uh, all at once. So markets have to take account of trade wars. They have to take account of developments in emerging markets. They have to take into account uh, a myriad of other factors, uh, U.S. politics, everything under the sun has to be factored in there. And in that sense, it's a great information aggregator. So I think that's a, a real strength. Now, financial markets are also trying to predict what uh, the central bank is going to do. So there is some circularity, and I think you do have to be very careful about that. Um, if, if policymakers are going to take signals from markets and, and markets are trying to guess what the, what the Fed's going to do, you, you have to get a fixed point of that process where there's some kind of agreement on what the best plan is. And, and some execution on that plan if the economy develops as expected. So you'd like these two to be close to each other. Um, but right now what's happening is that the, the SEP is projecting a hawkish path. Markets are predicting a somewhat dovish path. This has been true for several years now. And uh, even with that dovish path, uh, markets are saying that the Fed isn't going to hit its inflation target, even though we're going to have to back off our hawkish path and become more dovish. We're still not going to hit the inflation target, according to markets, if you just read it straight away. So in this situation, I, do not, I think um, it's not a case where financial markets are saying, oh, the Fed's going to be super aggressive and they're going to contain all the inflationary pressure in the, in the future, therefore I don't have to worry about it. They're not saying that. They're saying the F Fed's going to be dovish in the future, but they're still not going to hit the inflation target. All right. Um, obviously, financial market information is not infallible. Uh, there's only so much markets can do to try to predict uh, the future. Big shocks occur, could be way off uh, if that happens. Um, Nevertheless, I'm stressing that the empirical evidence on the yield curve predicting future uh, real activity in the U.S. is quite strong, and that tips-based measures of inflation expectations have been quite accurate in recent years, and uh, so policymakers and all of you should take these financial market signals very seriously. Well, why would we want to go down this path? Uh, what are the risks and what are the opportunities? First of all, I think yield curve inversion would increase the vulnerability of the U.S. to recession. Um, I think that's uh, an important risk 
Uh, I think in, on the inflation side, it's certainly possible that we get an inflation out, uh, outbreak, but that seems unlikely at this point. And anyway, if we're monitoring these inflation expectations carefully, uh, we'll see uh, we'll see incipient inflation when it develops because uh, because these measures will move up, will begin to move up in that case. So we'll keep those under close surveillance. I think that would uh, be one way to keep in, uh, inflation in check. And then there's financial stability risks, which I'm not really discussing in this talk, but they're generally considered moderate at this point. Uh, we could argue about that. Um, and arguably, financial stability risks are being addressed through the enhancements to uh, financial market regulation through Dodd-Frank and through stress testing. I mean, we could argue about all of that and whether that's really working and it really effective. But that, that strategy has been that uh, we tried to put a lot better systems in place and we think we have a much safer banking system than we had uh, because of that. The opportunities would be quite uh, appealing in my mind. The current expansion has been long, but it's been very slow on average. Uh, the level of output coming out of the recession today is still way below what it would, have, would be with one of the other expansions that we had in the post-war era. In fact, it's the lowest of all of those. So that suggests that there might be a lot long ways to go here for the expansion because uh, the growth rate has been so slow coming out. So it hasn't been the kind of boom that you might have expected or that we got, let's say, after the 80-82 uh, recession. Also, the strong performance of labor markets today is very uh, important and I think could provide a lot of benefits for the U.S. economy. You're pulling people in off the sidelines that would otherwise be marginally attached workers. Uh, they would otherwise stay home. You'd like to bring them in, get their skills developed, get them into a job. Then when the next recession does come, they'll be more, uh, more able to cope uh, in that situation. So I think uh, there's a lot that could be done on the labor market side. You'd like to get things like African-American unemployment or Hispanic unemployment down to uh, economy-wide levels. Uh, they tend to run too high. You'd like to see all that come, uh, those come down to uh, more normal levels. And um, so I think there's a lot to be said for strong labor market uh, performance. But I saw the JOLTS report yesterday said that there were 11 job openings for every unemployed uh, every 10 unemployed people. I think that's a, the right way to say this. It's about a one-to-one -one ratio. To me, that's, that's the right way to think about the labor market, because that's how you'd like the labor market to be operating, uh, kind of one opening for everybody that's, uh, that's unemployed. That, that sounds really good to me. And then there's a lot of churn, and so people are moving in and out of unemployment, and job openings are, are opening and closing. Um, so that sounds great to me. We should describe that as a normal labor market, not as an overheated labor market. Uh, <clears throat> this is a slide on uncertainty. Some of you will know this issue. There's a technical issue about parameter uncertainty. Uh, there's a Fed paper about it that's cited in the footnote here. Um, parameter uncertainty means that uh, you're trying to make policy but uh, one of the parameters that you need is uncertain. It has a distribution around it. And how should you react to that parameter uncertainty? That is a very old issue in macroeconomics. Uh, Brainerd, 1967 paper, career-making paper for him at Yale, uh, suggested that when model parameters are in doubt, policy should be more cautious than otherwise. So if you're not sure what the Phillips curve slope is, or you're not sure what the persistence of inflation is, or something like that, then you should be very slow and very cautious in moving the policy rate around. That's what Brainerd would say. Hansen and Sargent did, uh, Lars Hansen here, uh, University of Chicago, um, suggested, wrote a whole book on this, and they suggested that in some cases you might want to be more aggressive in that case, not more cautious in that case. So there's two schools of thought around how you should handle this parameter uncertainty issue. My point to you is this is an esoteric issue. Uh, 
and this is an issue that the Fed always faces. It's not, we're not just facing this brand new right now. Uh, we face this ever since we started making monetary policy, and so I don't think this is something that would be particularly salient now uh, as opposed to where we've been uh, in the past. All right, so that's my talk. Uh, so let's open it up for questions and see what you guys, uh, what's on your mind this morning. Um, the basic points are uh, we should put more weight than usual on financial market signals in the current macro environment because the Phillips curve is broken down. Um, we have to handle this kind of information carefully, but handled properly. Uh, financial market information can provide a basis for better forward-looking monetary policy strategy. And the flattening yield curve and subdued market-based inflation expectations suggests that current monetary policy stance is already neutral or possibly somewhat restrictive. So I'm going to stop there and let you guys ask questions. You've been very attentive. Thanks very much, and thanks for inviting me today. I think we have two microphones going around, so you can. Good morning. Okay, there we go. Um, so, Dr. Bully, you talked a little bit about um, rates already being restrictive or potentially being restrictive, yet real Fed funds are still negative. Can you talk about why that trigger rate is so low today versus history? Or conversely, talk about why um, long-term interest rates are not reflective of real growth? Yeah, uh, I think I've given a, a talk on this um, called uh, Our Star Wars, The Phantom Menace. We worked for about two days on that one. Uh, our Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, is kind of my take on the Our Star issue. But I'll give you the nutshell version of this. Just take something really simple like a one-year nominal treasury yield. Subtract off your favorite measure of core inflation, annual core inflation, trailing. That will be an ex post measure of a one-year real interest rate. If you plot that from the mid-1980s till today, it has fallen a staggering 600 and some basis points. That trend line has been negative for 30 years. That's not the Fed. We can move interest rates around a little bit, uh, you know, quarter to quarter, year to year, but that long-term trend reflects longer term trends in the economy, in the global economy, and uh, what are those long term trends? Productivity growth is one, so declining uh, rates of productivity growth on average, and we've been low in recent years, that's contributing, one factor that's contributing. Another factor that's contributing is demographics, so demographics of uh, population growth and labor force growth has slowed down. So that's another factor, that's a contributing factor. But those two together cannot account for this 600 basis point decline. You need something else. The something else is the demand for safe assets globally has increased dramatically and this has, uh, this has um, raised prices and decreased the yield on treasury, short term treasury securities. And it's that factor that's the, the biggest factor that has moved short-term real rates uh, to very low levels. Now, when you're looking at that 600 basis point decline you should, and 30 years, you should ask yourself, do I think that this is suddenly going to be an inflection point and those three things are going to all of a sudden turn around and go the other direction and we're going to return to some kind of real interest rate that we saw in the 1980s? And the answer to that is an emphatic no. Uh, the demographics in particular is definitely not going to turn around very quickly, uh, or if at all, and uh, productivity maybe could, could go higher, keep an eye on that, but and this demand for safe assets globally also, uh, I think, unlikely to turn around. That, that is being driven 
in part by the fact that emerging market economies are growing rapidly, faster than developed uh, world economies, but emerging market debt issuance for a, for a wide variety of reasons isn't anything like U.S. debt issuance or European debt issuance. So you don't have enough safe instruments for the size of the global economy and you've also got increasing regulatory reasons for holding these, these types of assets and for all those reasons I don't ex expect the demand for safe assets to turn around very quickly. So this means that this, this uh, R star, this, this short term real interest rate is low today and it's likely to stay pretty low. The, my estimates are actually negative today but you can argue with that but I think it's negative and I do not expect mean reversion. I do not expect this thing to go back to levels that we saw in the 80s or 90s or even the 2000s. About 10 years ago, the Fed started paying interest on deposits held at the Fed, and so banks have had the excess reserves there. We've started to notice banks are starting to take out some of those excess reserves, and with those excess reserves having a zero money multiplier on it, now that they're flowing back into the economy, how is the Fed, Fed looking at the velocity of money and could that lead to upside inflation risk? Uh, if I have my chart in my head correct, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, M2 growth has actually been declining uh, in the last year or 18 months, correct? So actually I think the, if you wanted to do a, a monetary kind of thing, and M2 has not been too bad over the last, uh, over this whole era here, it has predicted low inflation as well. Um, but it doesn't look like that's accelerating or anything's happening there. So if you just took a very traditional approach to that, which I, you know, we could argue about, but uh, uh, it doesn't look like too much is happening on, on that front as far as I've seen. I would keep an eye on this issue though. I think it's an important issue. So you made a really compelling case for um, market-based signals and incorporating that into some policy decision making. What's the counterpoint? Why not incorporate market signals? Um, I think the, the question is what's the counterpoint to what I'm saying? I guess you have to ask other people. <laughs> but, uh, they, uh, I, I would say that there is tremendous faith in, uh, in Phillips curve type ideas even when the data has, has gone the other way on them. So um, some people will say, yeah, the, the numbers don't look good today, the slope doesn't looks like it's zero today, but once the economy really heats up, then we'll see a nonlinear Phillips curve and we'll really see these effects uh, come through. And I think that that is not true. Um, the, those kinds of results did happen in the 60s and 70s, but that's because inflation expectations were unanchored at that time. And so you had a lot of things going on, a lot of moving parts, and inflation expectations got out of control and we got a huge inflation problem, not just in the US but globally. Um, so, but in the inflation targeting era where you have all these central banks around the world have all this credibility and they have explicit inflation targets, that doesn't happen and so you're not going to see the Phillips curve come back to life here. Uh, so it's really the, uh, based on an interpretation of that, that data. Along the similar lines of the last question, you mentioned looking at Sorry, uh, along the similar line of the last question, you mentioned looking at financial I thought you were in the Cayman markets. Islands or something. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I wish. Um, you mentioned looking at financial market signals. How do you handicap or factor the QE that's been done and that impact on markets? Yeah, great question. Great question. So when we were buying uh, assets, we were doing QE in the U.S., um, there was a story that was told, the leading story about why this had an impact was that it was a signal that we weren't going to raise rates anytime soon. So if you're buying a bunch of assets and doing QE, you're probably not going to raise rates while you're doing that. Okay, so there's a signaling story 
about uh, quantitative easing, that that's the reason why it had as big of impacts as it did. And I do think the uh, impacts, especially in financial markets, were quite strong. Um, now that we've come off zero on the policy rate and we've moved the policy rate up, now balance sheet doesn't have any signal anymore for what we're going to do with the policy rate. So now markets are back focused on the policy rate. They're not looking at balance sheet, and that's appropriate because the balance sheet isn't telling you anything about what the policy rate is, where the policy rate is going to go. So for this reason, I think there isn't any signaling going on now from balance sheet actions, and so um, it's not having uh, nearly the impact or, or very, very slight impact compared to what it had uh, during earlier parts of the expansion. Does that make sense? Sorry. It's my story and I'm sticking to it. So. <laughs> okay. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. Thank you for your comments today. Sure. Um, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are and the Fed's thoughts with regards to the labor force participation rate, which as you know has been begrudgingly low, multi-decade low. Um, and what maybe or if any inflation expectations that signal gives? Yes, yeah, a great, uh, a great question. Uh, several, so I had great success uh, several years ago by, uh, by just taking on board the idea that labor force participation in the U.S. was being driven lower by demographic factors. And I was really influenced by some of these studies that um, were studies that were written in the 2006 time frame and used pure demographic models, really no economics or very little economics. They just counted how many people were in different uh, demographic bins and how that would change going forward and what their propensities were to participate in a labor market. And these guys were writing in 2006, and they correctly predicted almost exactly the labor force participation rate in 2013, 2014, 2015 timeframe. So, I mean, that was an astounding success as far as, uh, as far as predicting a macroeconomic variable. We never get anything right. So, uh, so to get that right was great. So that influenced me to think that there was this downward sloping trend uh, in labor force participation. Because of that, I predicted faster unemployment rate decline than other people did, and I got that right. So I beat up my colleagues on that one. Now, in the last two years, though, the, the story has changed. There really are people being, uh, because of the strong labor market, people are coming in off the sidelines, and you're seeing, especially the 25 to 54 uh, cohort, that labor force participation rate is definitely climbing back up. However, that participation rate is still a point and a half below where it was before the, uh, before the recession. So we've got some room to run on that if you're worried about sort of labor market overheating kinds of issues. Um, so I, I'm modifying my views again a little bit about labor force participation. I do think that when you get a very good labor market like you have today, you do get people to rethink their labor force participation decision. And I would actually say that if you don't, don't remember anything that I said today, just the, the best thing you can do in your personal life is think about your extended family or people that you know or friends who have been, for whatever reason, have had trouble in the labor market, you should get them into a job now. Now is the time for them to, uh, to make the decision to, and change their life, get back in the labor market. And then they'll accumulate some skills and get settled, and hopefully they'll do better uh, the next time the economy turns down. So I actually think that that's one of the best things uh, we can do uh, right now uh, in uh, you know, in the U.S. labor market is get, get marginally attached workers back to work. Hi, thank you. Um, the Fed's currently in the process of removing policy accommodation through both the short-term interest rate and the gradual unwinding of the uh, balance sheet. Um, yet you've also indicated that the near inversion of the yield curve should be a, a source of concern. Um, and also identified the, you know, the lack of safe assets um, given that, has the Fed thought about uh, reducing the average maturity or duration of its portfolio um, to see what impact that might have on the yield curve and if it would, you know, ease the, um, 
the flattening or restriction pressure to open up policy means in other areas? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great idea. So the, the Fed did do an operation twist uh, during, I guess, 2011 time frame, if I have my years right. And uh, uh, that uh, meant that we sold uh, at the short end, bought at the, at the long end uh, in an effort to reduce longer term yields at that time. So what we could do is undo that and um, go back toward uh, the shorter end. Um, that's not something that's been part of the active discussion, uh, but I would like to see more discussion of that issue. I think that would be uh, a logical uh, thing to do here. Um, there, I would say just generally speaking, there's a tension with the idea that we, I don't know if it's, uh, it's probably too, more than you want to know here, but uh, 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 I was an advocate of a f uh, last in first out uh, strategy. So you lowered the policy rate, you hit zero, then you started to do quantitative easing, the economy gets better, now how are you going to get out of this? I said. Well, let's undo the quantitative easing, and then later we'll worry about raising the policy rate. I lost that argument to Ben Bernanke, who said, no, we don't want to do it that way. We want to raise the policy rate and then somehow get the balance sheet reduction later or something. But that's kind of a tension because you're, uh, you're raising the policy rate, and arguably you've still got that overhang out there on the long end of the yield curve. and you know could be that, that that's uh, causing some inversion issues and stuff like that. So why not reduce the pressure on the longer and allow uh, longer term yields to go up? That's all contradictory to what I said earlier because I said earlier that it was all signaling anyway, so it, it wouldn't matter. But, um, but I'd like to see at least more discussion of that type of issue. I think that'd be good. I have a question in whether or not you think the size of the U.S. versus the size of China changes the history or forward-looking market. So most of our history and our economics are based on when the U.S. was the largest global market. Yeah. And now you have China, which is as equal in size, maybe not as equal in terms of interest from investors. But how, do you, how does the Fed take that into consideration when, this, when looking at these market statistics? Yeah, I think uh, there was always, uh, well, first of all, the European economy, if you add it all together, is slightly bigger than the U.S., but for purposes of discussion, let's just say it's the same as the U.S. And Japan, uh, maybe about half uh, the U.S., and China uh, surpassing Japan recently, in recent years, and growing rapidly. So you've really got a four four nodes sort of in the global economy and, and, then, uh, and then you've got a lot of smaller players, uh, emerging market players and so on. So the, the traditional um, idea has been that for the major players, you should have flexible exchange rates. Those economies are not that open. Uh, they're big, because they're big economies, they're not that open compared to, let's say, Switzerland or the Netherlands or something like that. So um, you, would, you would have these flexible exchange rates and you'd have free ca capital flows and then the smaller countries would have to decide how they want to run their exchange rate policy. That is not happening uh, because China has not completely liberalized its capital market and because they uh, tightly control their exchange rate, exchange rate policies basically to manage to the dollar pretty closely. And uh, I've long wondered uh, that if, whether we have the uh, right attitudes about what U.S. monetary policy should be when you have a big country that is managing so closely to the dollar. Um, it's one thing if you have Panama managing to the dollar, or Panama dollarized. You know, technically we should take into account the Panamanian GDP gap. Uh, when we're making U.S. monetary policy, but because they're so small, we don't have to worry about that. But China is not a small country, and they're getting bigger. 
and uh, you know you don't have the capital flows. So you've got a lot going on on the China side about when you're thinking about international monetary coordination. Um, there's a lot to be said on that issue, and it has been talked about extensively uh, in the academic literature as well. By the way, something, I think you all know this, but you need to keep in mind, when China reaches the per capita income of the U.S., it will be four times bigger than the U.S. We, so just to give you an example of a, a country that does, has that today, it would be the U.K. So we would play the role to China that the U.K. plays to the U.S. today. So that's something I don't think most of America has in the back. That's a fun fact to have in the back of your head. So, please. It, on the, the market-based impact, you had mentioned early about how demand for um, risk-free assets pushed down the, the one year. How do you think about that national, or, you know, think about what's going on abroad with low rates and the demand that pushes on the 10-year, that perhaps is a signal, you know, there's this excess demand for, for yield that perhaps makes, distorts the impact of the 10-year as a, as a signal for the U.S. economy? I'm sorry, I, I think I missed the first part of what you were saying. Uh, I guess, in short, how do you think about demand for yield and the impact on the 10-year, you yeah. know, given the international buyers could yeah. perhaps be forced into you know, I, that? I, at a very practical level, I think it's a, I think it's a huge problem for the market. Uh, I don't know if it's a problem, but it's a reality uh, that if the U.S. 10-year starts to approach 3%, it just looks very, very attractive to international buyers, and, and they want that yield. And uh, so that's one reason I think I've said in other, not today, but I've said in other talks, can the, really, can the U.S. really go alone and normalize alone? Uh, when you've got uh, interest rates in Germany and uh, Europe generally and in Japan so low um, because as soon as, as soon as we go up even a little bit, we attract a lot of buyers from around the world. So um, I think that is contributing to, uh, you know, pressure on the yield curve and the yield curve inversion. Jim, uh, you touched upon it briefly about the Fed's balance sheet, but there's been discussion and I think there's work and due diligence being conducted now on what is the right size of the balance sheet and maybe we don't have to reduce it as quickly or as much as we initially forecasted. Uh, what are your current thoughts on that? And then just a, a separate one, uh, you mentioned tariffs and trade wars a little bit in your presentation with the markets, um, interpreting on that side. What are your thoughts on, on that end? Uh, okay, so the first question is size of the balance sheet. Um, I think it's a good time to revisit this question. Uh, the FOMC has debated this in the past, but, but now I think we should look at it again, and we should s lay down a uh, strategy for where we, where we ultimately want to be. We have said things in the past. We've said that ultimately we want to have an all-treasuries portfolio, which would mean the, all the MBS eventually run off. That will take a long time, but eventually we'd be all treasuries. And that the size of the balance sheet should be no larger than necessary to run a great monetary policy for the U.S. The, the, the hook there is, well, what size do we need to run a good monetary policy? Um, now, if you just, I'll just maybe make a couple comments about the hazards of the, this balance sheet issue. One thing that people do is that, you know, you're talking about something like what the balance sheet would be in 2024 or something like that, many years in the future. You have to take account of the growth rate of the economy. So the, the size of the balance sheet is actually falling faster than you think because nominal GDP is growing. And so it's uh, plus we're, we're allowing runoff. So it's actually falling faster than you think. And then it, it does make a difference when you're talking about five years in the future or 10 years in the future. You know, what, what it's a lot of times people throw around just raw numbers like two and a half trillion or three trillion or three and a half trillion, but it's got to be relative to the size of the economy at that point. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. If you just take the pre the pre crisis balance sheet, which is uh, over 800 billion. You just project out nominal GDP and you account for uh, cash. Cash has actually grown uh, all through this era. Uh, 
you know, you get a pretty big number as a starting point. Uh, and then on top of that, you want to add uh, maybe several hundred billion or 500 billion in reserves uh, because we're not going to run a scarce reserve system anymore. We're going to do something else uh, that has uh, more abundant reserves. Uh, it's easy to get over two trillion or even to two and a half trillion with those kinds of ideas in your head, depending on how what year you're talking about in the future. So I think those are some of the things you should be thinking about when you're trying to project uh, what this should be. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, tariffs. Huh. What's going on there? Uh, <laughs> um, Okay, uh, I think, here's what I think. I think the trade wars have been uh, uncertainty inducing for the US business community. I've talked to many CEOs in my district and around the country that are very concerned. Uh, this is causing hesitation in investment decisions. They're all trying to get uh, a handle on what's going to happen. However, getting a deal with Mexico and Canada, two of our biggest trading partners, would be a big boost because it would show that this tit for tat and, uh, and this trade war is not gonna go on forever, that it actually does have a possible solution and that solution has uh, lays down the rules for the foreseeable future that I think would be a big boost and a, a, a confidence boosting for the U.S. business sector because that would show that this is not going to go on forever. Most CEOs will tell me, sure, I can handle the tariff for six months and I can do this and I can adjust, but is this, am I going to have to, is this the new reality where I'm going to have to, for the next 10 years, we're going to be doing tit for tat uh, tariffs uh, all the time and uh, that's going to, if we did, that would inject a lot of uncertainty into U.S. business decisions. So if we can get the deal, I think it'll be a big boost uh, for the U.S. economy. I do not see progress on China, and I'm expecting that to last for a very long time. I think there is a global consensus that China has unfair trade practices that have been allowed to go on for a long time since they entered the WTO. Uh, these are mostly non-tariff barrier non-WTO probably issues, but issues nevertheless, if you're trying to do business in China, I think the global corporate community wanted access to Chinese markets and was willing to put up with this for a long time, but now they feel, it's not just the US, but pretty much all countries feel like they're not treated the same way when they're in China as they are in the US or in Europe. So. For that reason, I, I'm not sure that we make much progress on the Chinese side. I'm reading just in recent days that maybe the Chinese are having a change of heart here. Uh, we'll see. But um, I think they need to come more in the spirit of the WTO than they have been uh, historically uh, over the last 15 years. Hi. You, you talked a little bit about financial stability and the role of regulatory changes in, in Dodd-Frank. Um, I'm curious how you view the Fed's role in maintaining financial stability, um, also in, in the global context of, of global central banks, uh, particularly with some of the challenging demographics you've cited, um, you know, high debt levels, just interested in how central banks are, are you know, are or are not responsible for that. Um, okay, on financial stability, I would I would say, generally speaking, uh, we have a safer banking system than we had 10 years ago, so I think that is uh, uh, widely agreed. Um, we also have better radar for the possibility of financial instability uh, than we had. Uh, the Fed created an entire unit that tracks this and reports to the FOMC on a regular basis, um, so I think there's obviously much greater appreciation for what can go wrong after the disaster of 2007 to 2009. So I think in that sense, uh, things are much better. The Dodd-Frank itself was banking-centric. Uh, 
I do not think the next crisis will occur inside the banking system, and the last one did not occur inside the banking system. It was in the shadow banking system. I think the same thing will happen for the next crisis. It will occur outside the banking system. One of the things people said when Dodd-Frank was passed was, uh, I think, was right and is turning out to be true, which is that if you put a lot of regulation on one sector, uh, people will try, or the, the economy will try, generally speaking, to um, get around those regulations and do the same types of business, but not exactly the same type of business outside the regulatory structure, and this will eventually eat away all the profits of the banking sector and everything will be done outside the banking sector. So when I look at FinTech and I look at Silicon Valley and I hear uh, investor pitches in Silicon Valley, they seem to be talking exactly that and you guys have heard it all uh, too. So I think what will happen is that the, uh, the, the regulatory structure will not be able to adapt quickly enough uh, to those new business models which are even now being developed and uh, at some point, I'm not saying they're unstable today, but at some point in the future uh, there will be a crisis and this is the history of financial crises is that um, you, you react by, you know, it's kind of like whack-a-mole, you react by putting a lot of pressure on the, on the area that had problems last time but then new problems arise in the future. So to be really good at preventing future financial crises, we're gonna have to get much better at uh, thinking about how new business is models are being developed in the financial sector and how to regulate those effectively going forward. And I don't see a lot on that. I see a lot of focus on very traditional uh, banks and I see a lot of focus on making sure that they have strong balance sheets um, and not much focus on the rest of the financial sector. Ah. Hi, quick question about the, uh, your view on uh, government explicit guarantee on MBS and the overall role of government in the you know, mortgage finance. Yeah. And a second quick question is, uh, uh, you mentioned why it was, but you, know, you see in the future no place for MBS in the in the Treasury portfolio, in, in the Fed portfolio, uh, federal, certain federal uh, banks like Switzerland, even by stocks, I mean, why mortgages would not have place in, in I mean, your What's view? the second question? Uh, about the, the, the holdings of uh, mortgages in the Treasury portfolio, you don't see that that's... Uh, Our holdings? Yeah. Oh, okay. You, you see that on Treasury, be, you know, being only Treasury only portfolio of the future, why not? I think we are going to try to go to all treasuries, but uh, it's going to take a long time for the MBS to, to run off. And so uh, basically it just depends how fast the housing market moves. So, uh, so it's going to take a long time. So I think they'll still be on their uh, way in the future in the late 2020s. I think you'd still have some MBS hanging around. But the, the attitude is to go to all, all treasuries. I think the first part was about um, reform in, uh, yeah. Well, it's been a sad fact that uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have not been reformed. They're still in conservatorship, and here we are a decade later. It's really inexcusable that this has not happened. Um, there's a wide variety of factors around that. I would like to see um, more private sector uh, involvement in the mortgage market and less, uh, you know, less dominance by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but there are many competing interests that are keeping those two alive. Some of you know my, uh, my predecessor, Bill Poole, made some famous speeches about how Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were undercapitalized in the mid-2000s. Um, they came back and said, oh no, you don't understand risk management, we're well capitalized, blah, 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 that cost taxpayers, uh, the single biggest uh, bill to taxpayers came from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So um, I think uh, there's just not been enough uh, urgency of reform around this issue and so I'm not really seeing much changing in the, in the near future. I will say this, the conforming limits are way, way too high. A good, a sim very simple approach would be to say that the, you have a jumbo mortgage market uh, and 
that's, a, that's a playground where you can let the private sector do whatever it wants to do, and you're talking about high, high net worth health households anyway, you don't need to be subsidizing those guys. But what you should do is get those conforming limits way down, uh, much lower than they are today. Uh, median household income in the U.S. is $50,000. If you say they can borrow two and a half times income, that's $125,000. That's about where they, you know, that's for the median. Should be lower than that even. You're trying to subsidize low-income households here. Uh, if you subsidize everybody, then you're subsidizing nobody. So uh, we can all take a dollar out of our pocket and pass it all around here, and uh, that's, you know, and then we all end up with a dollar in the end. That's not helping anybody. So if the purpose is to encourage home ownership uh, at the low end of the income distribution, then we should say that that's what we're trying to do, and then do that. But then uh, Congress wants to continually, oh, I want to extend this to more and more people, uh, but that dilutes the value of any subsidy that would be there in the first place. So I'm not quite sure what we think we're doing uh, with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It's, it's high time for reform. I have looked at reform proposals. Unfortunately, they're very complicated, and uh, so I'm not sure if any progress is going to be made. But it is inexcusable that we're a decade later and we haven't fixed uh, the housing finance system in the U.S. We have time for one last question. Mm -hmm. So we see the correlation with inversion and recessions. Is there a causation of inversion and recessions? Is that just bank lending, the spreads get tighter, and credit comes in, and you got to pay demand? Yeah, I don't think it's that hard to tell at least a casual story about why there might be uh, feedback. Uh, because, you know, as far as I understand banking, uh, you're supposed to take deposits at a low return and lend them out at a high return, and the inverted yield curve is not helping you. <laughs> If that's your business, uh, it's more complicated than that. But um, uh, I do think it's a mismatch. The yield curve inversion is a mismatch between the Fed's assessment of where the economy is and what's going to happen over the next couple of years, and the market's assessment of w where the economy is and what's going to happen over the next couple of years. And the market is saying uh, they see growth returning to lower levels. They see very little inflation pressure. Uh, the Fed is saying um, they see more inflation pressure through this, through this Phillips curve channel, and that's the mismatch that's being occurred. Let me just expound on this though for a little bit. In the past, in the Fed, you know, you'd be sitting in this situation where the economy's been growing for quite a while, output gaps are positive, labor markets are going well, but inflation would be maybe too high, maybe 3% or 4% or something like that. In that situation, policymakers would be sitting around saying, well, I know the yield curve inversion is increasing inflation, you know, recessionary risk, but that's okay because I kind of have an inflation problem and if we do go into recession, at least I'll fix my inflation problem. So hopefully we won't go into recession, but if we do, then it will get inflation lower. And that has actually been uh, more or less formalized in the 1990s with uh, chatter about the opportunistic approach to disinflation. You guys probably don't remember this, but uh, uh, if I have it correctly, I think Don Cohn made speeches like this where he said, um, he said, well, you know, inflation is still 3% in the U.S. in the 90s. We'd like to get down to 2%, but we're not going to try to be aggressive to do that. We'll just wait whenever the next recession comes, then uh, that'll ratchet inflation down, and then we'll hit 2%, and then we'll call it quits at that point. That was a, kind of a lot of the discussion in the 90s. My point is, we we're, do not have that today. We barely are up to inflation, our inflation target today, and we've been below it for six years. So the next time a, a recession comes, we're gonna uh, it's probably gonna put some downward pressure on inflation, we're, and because of that, we're gonna miss our inflation target over the next five years probably. So. Um, so we're, we're not in the same situation that we were in the 70s and 80s where you could make the argument that, no, I don't want a recession, but if a recession comes, it will have this silver lining that it will bring inflation down. That is not the situation we're in today. Inflation's been low. It's been below target. Uh, 
we're just barely up to target today. So, um, so there is no silver lining to getting into a recessionary situation today on the inflation front. All right, you guys have been great. You have to get to work. Uh, so do I. So uh, thanks very much. <laughs>